Hey everybody, welcome back to another webinar from the Eki Ranch. Today's topic is Understanding Poinsettia Flower Initiation. This is the third session in our 2010 Poinsettia webinar series. Uh, my name is Rebecca Simmonsma. I'm the Technical Services Manager for the Eki Ranch. And I also have with me today Roger Kehoe, Senior Key Account Sales Manager. Welcome everyone. I uh, hope you enjoy our webinar today, continuing the series on Poinsettia production tips. All right, thanks Roger. Uh, before we start the presentation, we're going to go through some housekeeping items. You can hear us, but we can't hear you because of the large number of people on today's call. We would like to encourage you to ask as many questions as you can think of during our session using the question and answer toolbar to the right of your screen. There's also a little um, like raise your hand function. And if you want to raise your hand, that just kind of gives me a heads up that you've asked a question. But I do check those frequently throughout the webinar. And we will address, we'll have some stopping points where we'll address as many questions as we possibly can. As always, this session is being recorded and it can be found live approximately 24 hours after the session at www.eki.com on our uh, webinar and video viewing function called On Media. Um, so if you'd like to share it with coworkers or just want to look at it again, uh, you'll want to look for that there at On Media. And don't feel like you have to scramble to take notes because it'll all be there for you to view it on media later. Okay, so the topic for today's discussion is poinsettia flower initiation, and when we planned this uh, webinar series for the summer, you know, if most of you that are frequent webinar viewers uh, remember that last year we did kind of a back to basic series where we covered kind of some basic poinsettia topics. This year we went the other direction and, and really jumped into some topics um, that are really high level, uh, kind of in detailed scientific approaches to poinsettia production. And we felt like poinsettia flower initiation, even for the most experienced grower, uh, was probably a topic that isn't always understood the best. And so today's topic is flower initiation and the science behind flower initiation. And then we'll go through all those different factors that can affect uh, when exactly the plants initiate, all those cultural things that you're doing like growth regulator applications and temperatures and uh, photo period, et cetera, that can change what the plant is actually doing. Um, so to get us started off, I'm going to go through the actual science part of flower initiation so that you understand what's going on um, and the physiological processes of the plant. So first, what, you know, why is it important to understand flower initiation? Uh, we could take the approach that you know, we just know that they do it and that's fine, um, and maybe your crop comes in you know, within five to seven to 10 days each year and that's good enough. Well, it's, for some growers, hitting that target sale date almost exactly is critical, and part of that is proper scheduling and scheduling your crop accordingly so that you hit target sale dates and a critical part of scheduling is knowing when the plants initiate. Uh, the response time, all poinsettias have a different response time, is that time from initiation to anthesis. If you know when the plants have initiated and you know their response time, you know approximately when they'll be ready, give or take, uh, depending on what you do with your culture. However, if you're not real sure when they initiated, the response time doesn't necessarily mean a lot at that point. So um, another important reason would be that on pinch plants, that time between pinch and flower initiation, or what we have always called the vegetative growth phase, is where the plant is doing you know, the bulk of its growing. And once it initiates, it's limited to what it can put on for vegetative growth. So you need to make sure that you allow enough time between pinch and flower initiation to make sure that you get adequate size. If you don't know when they initiate and you're just pinching you know, based on when you've always pinched, you're not really sure what you're getting in there for vegetative growth, and it can be kind of a guessing game. Another important reason to know when the plants initiate would be that certain PGRs must be continued around flower initiation. And some examples that we just talk about quickly would be B9 and Florel. Uh, B9 can actually inhibit flower initiation when it's applied on top of um, you know, that process. And so if you don't know what's going on and when they're initiating, then you can't schedule your growth regulator applications accordingly. And then temperature management around the time of flower initiation is critical because it will have a pretty significant impact on when that process takes place. So first we'll go through kind of the basics of flower initiation. Um, hopefully for those of you that are growing poinsettias, you know that they are a photoperiodic plant. Uh, they do require short days or more accurately long nights to flower. Uh, the critical night length has is uh, been approximately determined to be 11 hours and 40 minutes, or that means that the days must be shorter than 12 hours, 20 minutes for initiation. Uh, in most parts of North America, this takes place around at uh, around this, uh, the autumnal equinox, or September 21st or 22nd. 
So that means that from May 15th until the end of August, nights are short enough to keep the plants vegetative. So with those long days, the plants are going to stay naturally vegetative. That's why we recommend lighting until May 15th for those of you that are doing stock or trees uh, because the nights are long enough at that point that they could be um, flowering, and we'll talk about that later. That means approximately September 25th, that means the nights are sufficiently long for most cultivars or for your mid to late season cultivars that they're going to be flowering. Your early season cultivars, however, do initiate a little bit earlier, which is September 15th. So now I just said that, um, you know, until the end of October or the end of August and uh, the plants can stay vegetative and starting from the end of September on, they can be in flowering because the photo period is naturally what it needs to be. Well, that means that that period from about September 1st through the third week in September or October 1st is sort of a gray area. And what that means is that there's other factors, because the photo period is just close to what it needs to be, there's other factors that can influence when that plant actually initiates. And those factors would include things like temperatures, uh, growth regulators, and plant health. And so we'll go through those different factors in detail later and, you know, what you can do to manage those things to ensure that the plants initiate on time. So just some poinsettia uh, physiology for background. The actual flower on a poinsettia is called the saithia, and that's that pretty little yellow thing that we hope to see in the centers um, at retail. The saithia produces stamens and pollen, flowered by pist or followed by pistils, and then occasionally you will see ovaries produced. Uh, those are typically something that you don't see in the greenhouse environment, um, just because it, that process takes a little bit longer. Um, if you leave your plants over, you know, for uh, November and December, if you've got stuff that you're holding over through like December and January, um, it wouldn't be uncommon to see ovaries on the plant at that point. Sometimes the consumer would also see it as well. So the colorful bracts that we see are actually modified leaves. Uh, they're not actually, you know, true leaves and they're not part of the flower. The true bracts are located directly below the saithium in a whorl of three. And those are the bracts that when they come out, they're already colored when they emerge. Transitional bracts appear on the stem below the bracts, and those are the ones that emerge green and transition to color. So in this picture here, you can see an example of both. Um, hopefully you can see my cursor, and down here, that's a transitional bract where it's transitioning to color now, and then these bracts that are coming out here are actually true bracts. So typically when you see the sign of first color, you're going to see that on transitional bracts first. Flower initiation, um, that's the first stage of flowering, and that's actually microscopic changes that uh, occur in the marrow stem shoot tip beginning five to seven days after the critical night length is reached. Um, so these interesting pictures are actually an example of what that marrow stem looks like under an electron microscope and the eight stages that take place anywhere between the first 20 days after the inductive photo period and the length that... Um, each variety has a different length for when that process actually starts. And so that's where you start to see some of the variation in whether they initiate on the 15th, like your early initiators, or somewhere between that and all the way up to the 25th, like most traditional varieties. It's because that, you know, that point in time where the photo period is correct and uh, flower initiation can start, is a, that length is a little bit different for each variety. So these are the first four phases that you'll see and then these are the last four phases. And, you know, most growers aren't going to get their electro, electric, uh, electron microscope out and look at the meristem to see that those changes are taking place. Um, they usually just wait for the first sign of visible bud or the sign of first color. We do have some researchers that we're working closely with on some studies like heat delay, and they'll actually incorporate a microscope or microscope work so that they can, you know, accurately determine when that process actually starts. So that's where these pictures come from. We just thought it was kind of interesting for you to see. So at any point uh, during the first four weeks after flower initiation, and it's not just those 20 critical days where those phases are all uh, taking place, it can be anywhere from, you know, the start of that process all the way up to four weeks after initiation. If the po photo period isn't sufficient for, sufficient for any length of time, and that means, you know, maybe lights got left on one night or, you know, somebody forgot to pull the black cloth, et cetera, for various reasons, splitting can occur. And that's actually where the terminal bud aborts, and then you get three vegetative shoots behind it. And we've got some great pictures later where we'll, where we'll show you what a split looks like and, you know, what you can do if your plants actually split. So the next phase is visible, visible bud, and as I said, these are the transitional bracts that are coming out, so that's typically what you're going to see. Some varieties tend to show... 
uh, visible bud first where you actually see those cyathea forming. Some of them, the transitional bracts color up quite a bit before you see much of that uh, bud. It just varies depending on variety. And then we have first color. Again, here this is an example of one where it starts to show color first and you don't actually see those cyathea uh, in there in the center. And then anthesis. Typically, anthesis is considered when two cyathea are shedding pollen. This one here looks like we've got more going, but that's typically when we consider the plant saleable. And then this just shows the entire flowering sequence from the si uh, sign of first color or visible bud all the way to finish. And this uh, flowering sequence is part of our Bract meter that we'll talk about later, which is a tool that you can use, um, you know, if initiation doesn't take place when you think it should, or you've just got some factors that make the situation less than ideal. The Bract meter helps you kind of take the guesswork out of it and maybe make some adjustments to get the crop back on time. All right, do we have any questions? Roger, while I'm looking at questions, do you have any additional comments? Yeah, you know, we talk about initiation, and um, some of our growers ask questions about, uh, well, why some years do they seem to initiate earlier, and other years uh, they're initiating later, and some years when they initiate early, my flowers or my plants are um, somewhat shorter. And um, what happens there is sometimes you end up with a, uh, uh, a stark contrast that causes uh, an abrupt environmental change. Maybe the weather changes drastically, you go from hot and humid to cool. And those factors around the time of their natural initiation can impact the plant and kind of steer it into a, a very stark, quick reaction to the change in environment. So it's good to be aware of when your plants initiate. And we will provide a chart uh, later that will show you that. And know that you need to do what you can do environmentally to minimize the impact of the changes in the environment for the plant. And that could be uh, even watering, maintain good water levels. Uh, don't let them get too wet, don't let them get too dry, especially right at that initiation time. And that can help uh, offset the uh, impact from the environment. Okay, it looks like we don't have any questions that have come in yet, but I imagine we'll get more as we jump into this topic in further detail. Uh, just remember that if you have questions, they can be posted on the toolbar to the right hand of your screen. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Roger, and he's going to talk about um, some tools that you can use to actually physically manipulate initiation. Yeah, you can uh, make your plants flower earlier and you can uh, actually delay them for later sales. So we've got a couple of different tools in manipulating the day length to, to get the desired effect. We are able uh, at the ranch to produce poinsettias uh, all 12 months of the year, and we do that by uh, lighting them uh, or uh, later black clothing them to give them the short days when the days are naturally long uh, during the, the course of the summer, of course. So uh, let's take a look at some of these tools and the impact that they have on the process. Black clothing, uh, it restricts light from being intercepted by the plant and it forces early initiation. And just by giving the plant a 10 hour day or 14 hour night, a long night, uh, that's all you need to do uh, to get this effect. You need to pull the cloth. Typically a grower will pull the cloth in the evening around 6 p.m., keep it on until 8 a.m. Uh, that way you're still doing it uh, the day before. You don't forget to get up and do it, you know, at 3 a.m. or 4 a.m. And uh, it's much easier. You also are at cooler temperatures at that time rather than just trying to do all of your black cloth period uh, in the morning when if you have the cloth on after, you know, uh, 10 o'clock, uh, it gets too hot underneath it. So you got to watch for the heat build up underneath the cloth. And that's just a good way to do it is do some of it in the evening and then the rest of it in the early morning. And how much black clothing uh, do you need to continue? How long? Until about 10 days after the natural flower initiation date. That way, uh, without the cloth, the plant's still experiencing the long nights and short days. Light pollution, every year we get many, many calls and emails uh, in technical services on the subject of, uh, well, is it a problem? How much light is tolerable? It's really only about two foot candles. And you can see in this photo, 
uh, in the front of that greenhouse, you're probably going to see uh, more than two foot candles. And what will happen is the plants right by that front wall will be delayed, and then you'll see less and less delay as you go towards the rear of the greenhouse. So it's uh, worth it to invest in a light meter. Make sure you understand what those light levels are. But in a practical sense, if you can tell the silhouette of the plants and read a newspaper headline, you've really got too much light. You need to do something about it. And in this case, you could put a black plastic on that front wall to block the light. Since the light angle is fairly low, it is doubtful it would come in through the roof and uh, negatively impact the plants. You need to check that. But uh, some of those low angle lights, uh, you don't need to completely enclose the plant in the black. Just block the light source if it's in the distance, and that, that will uh, keep your light levels uh, plenty dark for good initiation. Here we have some good shots of the delay impact. On the left, that 2804 is actually Advent. It was in a greenhouse that was near a, a packing production area that was being utilized heavily in September for packing uh, some product that was going out, possibly mums, for example. So the light was filtering into that area of the greenhouse and delayed the flowering. This photo is taken on November 9th, and those of you who know Advent and have used it know that it's our earliest flowering variety and typically is in much color uh, by the 1st of November. So you can see the delay here. There can also be a reduction in the quality of that bract, not just a, a, a delay of uh, color with normal flowering following. So light pollution doesn't do a good job of initiation. It's not a clean initiation. The plant doesn't respond to it clearly. And you get kind of this muddied impact and a bract half buried. And uh, the secondary bracts aren't really coloring up very evenly. And it's generally poor quality. On the bottom right, some light got in through some black cloth and just hit an area of the plants uh, with just a little bit too much. And as you bleed away from that center, of the green, you can see you gradually get into uh, better and better coloring. So sometimes these things are inexplicable. Uh, it could be sometimes this type of effect can be seen by just a heat vent overhead that's blowing down on the plants, and you get a little heat delay in that area. And we'll talk about that some more. But just examples here of what uh, the impact can be in the flowering process just through uh, light infiltration and pollution. So where does it come from? It could be security lights, street lights, frequent traffic on nearby roads, the headlights from the cars if it's heavy enough, especially if maybe if you're at the bend in the road and the, the lights are just kind of pouring into the greenhouse too much for much of the uh, evening especially. Uh, sports complexes, um, full moon generally isn't really a problem, um, but uh, given that plus maybe some of these other impacts, so they're, they're additive and you can run into trouble. So uh, if in doubt, better to be safe and put some uh, black cloth uh, up there to, to protect them. Um, seven week cultivars, you should black cloth for about six weeks and your eight week cultivars, uh, black cloth for about seven weeks. Splitting, uh, especially during um, your flowering period, is really annoying because it distorts the flowers. We do have some good photos of that coming up. Black clothing is stopped too early. The plants may revert to a vegetative state. Remember I said wait 10 days after the natural initiation date to stop black clothing. The plant gets a mixed signal. It kind of starts to initiate, and then it aborts the initiation, goes back to vegetative. Then it eventually sets the bud up, and you get these three prongs that come out of tip growth, and it tends to all bloom, but it opens up the centers and makes it an unattractive Cyathea presentation. So uh, for those of you that grow trees, maybe you see splitting in May and some of those early plants. Uh, that goes to vegetative growth. Those shoots can get to be very long, and they're bothersome. This is a little different. Under the flowering timing in the fall, the split tends to just create an open center in the bract, and uh, kind of a poor presentation is We'll see in the next shot here. Up there on the left, you can see that opening up. Then you get kind of all these little, uh, you know, small primary bracts, and the secondaries are down underneath and poorly colored. And on the bottom right, that photo, you can see where they're just kind of bunched up and coming in at different angles and, and not very attractive at all. Uh, not totally unmarketable. Kind of makes it look like a semi-double or something, but uh, certainly not what we want. It's not the desired result.
You can also use light the other way to delay initiation. So you can keep the plant vegetative with artificial lighting. Uh, you can use night interruption lighting to do this, or you can do day length extension. We'll talk about these. But generally, you could take a variety like Freedom and light it and delay the flowering so that instead of flowering on November 20th, you might want it to flower December 1st. Um, some varieties are not too good to do that with. Others uh, works very well. In general, we don't recommend taking an extremely early variety like Advent and trying to light it for a December 10th flowering. You're better off to use a variety that's closer to that natural um, timing that you're, you're trying to achieve. So lights should provide 10-foot candles for a clear message to stay vegetative at plant height. And that's really important. Watch that light level. Certainly, if you're doing a lighting or a black cloth program, you know, if you've got baskets or tall or short plants, trees versus, uh, you know, four inch, you need to be really careful to make sure that what you're delivering is at the, at the plant height, right at the tip and the growing area of the plant to receive that message clearly, correctly. Night interruption lighting can run from 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. Same thing you would do for a chrysanthemum crop. Uh, conserve energy, you can have it run just 20 minutes out of every hour. So that way you don't have to run it for the whole 60 minutes every hour for four hours. Or you could cycle through and rotate the lights on a timer so that a group lights for 20 minutes, another group lights for 20 minutes, and a group after that lights for 20 minutes. You can use really almost any kind of light, incandescent, uh, any of the white light sources, compact fluorescents work well and save energy. High pressure sodium can be used, and many of you have that already. Uh, those oscillating reflector type of high pressure sodiums can be used to cover a, a wider area. You just want to be really sure that that light doesn't work its way out into the crop that you don't want to light. Maybe you have to put up a black plastic wall to separate the two. Be careful of light pollution from your own lighting program on the crop that you're doing in natural season. The lighting should begin about two weeks before the natural flower initiation date, and we'll give you those dates specifically. But you, again, you don't want them to kind of sense a message and then get another signal and then go back. It should be a good, clean signal. So we start plenty of time in advance, two weeks before natural flower initiation as a minimum. You could do it earlier than that if you want. wouldn't hurt, but certainly at least two weeks. Lighting should never continue past October 10th. It just delays the poinsettia to be, you're asking it to grow the end of November uh, or early December when conditions are, are poor for finishing. And a better option there if you need a late flowering plant is select a late variety and finish it cool and uh, you should be able to time it out. Much easier to control temperatures on the cool side in late November and December, even in uh, parts of the south, than it is to do it earlier on the earlier crop. And use desired sale date minus response time to determine the lighting schedule. So we'll talk a bit about scheduling, but it's very important to understand uh, what your ship date is, what your color date is, and then back up from that uh, to your what we call lights out time when you want to initiate the flower. Do we have any questions? We do. We've got some questions come in here. Uh, we mentioned, or you mentioned, Roger, that lighting should never continue past uh, October 10th. Um, and the importance of choosing varieties that are appropriate to the, you know, the sale date that you're working with. But, you know, what if you really like the attributes of a variety like Advent, say, for example, that has a shorter response time? Um, and you want to try to light that, uh, but even if you lit until October 10th, that's you know it's still going to be ready earlier than what than you what you want. So what if you just light past October 10th? What's the repercussions of that? Uh, the repercussions are that the plant is not finishing uh, under high light, so you can end up with smaller bracts. You may have trouble sizing the plant the way you want it. Uh, your heat inputs, of course, are going to increase. And I think really a better strategy, and Rebecca will be talking about our Bract meter, would be to utilize temperatures to control that timing rather than lighting to control the timing for those uh, later dates that you're looking for. Note also that we do have some good late varieties uh, uh, in, in our offering that will work for those December timings that you may be looking for, such as our new solstice, which is new this year in the catalog as an example. So you do have options uh, to have a complete program later 
Uh, and certainly October 10th, if you take a variety that's eight and a half weeks and light it October 10th, you're, you're working pretty late into the season. And what you'll find is that those response times tend to get a little longer if you light a little bit and you go uh, later into the season, and that's because the growing conditions aren't as good uh, for those late crops uh, as they are for the earlier crops that you finish. Okay, I've got a great question here. So this grower uh, did both Prestige and Prestige Early Red side by side, uh, started black clothing at the same time, and had them both finish at the same time, but expected an earlier finish on Prestige Early Red. Uh, what's that about? Well, under black clothing program, prestige uh, or lit programs will have the same response time as prestige early so the two are together your prestige early and your prestige red really can't be tell you can't tell them apart just on the basis of uh, the fact that once they initiate they will finish the same way so the thing of it is is that uh, if you light prestige for an extra 10 days or prestige early for an extra 10 days, it really finishes just like prestige uh, does. So prestige early is the same. I think what we see is many growers will ask us, it's one of our, our most common questions, is about uh, the height where, well, my prestige early is shorter than my prestige. Well, why is that? That's because it initiated earlier. And unless you back up your schedule, we'll talk about that a little bit, but unless you back up your schedule on Prestige early, it will finish uh, a couple inches shorter because it has less time from pinch to start of short days to grow the vegetative plant under the bract. Okay, so this next question, uh, this person is wondering if there are certain varieties that are just not recommended for lighting or for black clothing. Yeah, one that comes right to mind would be the Enduring Series. Uh, it just does not grow well under darker conditions later, and uh, there are other options. Um, certainly the Freedom Group is good for lighting for, for later color, but uh, we don't recommend lighting Enduring uh, at all because a week of lighting might equate to two or three weeks of delayed flower and poorer flower formation. It's a highlight plant that needs the extra light of the earlier finish uh, period. Okay. Looks like we've covered all of our questions. So with that, we're going to move on in the presentation. And the next topic will be all those factors that we mentioned early in the presentation that can have an influence on flower development and when initiation actually takes place. The first of those factors that we're going to talk about is temperature. Uh, cooler temperatures can, believe it or not, have an impact, impact on when the plants actually initiate. Uh, first things that we want to point out about temperature uh, is that during the month of September, that's not the time to be cutting corners on temperatures. I know here in South Dakota last night, it got down to 48 degrees. So I would hope that my uh, upper Midwest and growers that are out here on the prairie had turned on their heat last night because it did get chilly. Um, you know, the repercussions of too cold of temperatures during the month of September are plants that end up being too short because they just don't need, they just aren't getting the temperatures, uh, the you know, the temperatures that they need for adequate vegetative growth. It's always, a, it's also a lot cheaper to turn on the heater now than it is in November uh, when you're trying to get vegetative growth and force them. So just keep that in mind. Um, you know, what, just another, you know, quick push for our plug for the cold grow program too, for those of you that have listened to our webinars on cold grow. Um, you know that uh, reducing your temperatures is calculated and it's, you know, based on different phases of flower development and it's really just a, not a good idea to drop those temperatures before October 1st. It's a good idea to let them get some good vegetative growth and let them initiate before you stop to drop temperatures. Excessively cold temperatures after flower initiation can actually um, force the plants to revert to vegetative growth and you could get uh, not necessarily those blind shoots that we talked about but where they just the flower development process stops all together. Uh, so what are the best temperatures for flower initiation? Well uh, we recommend 68 degrees ADT with nights not below uh, 65 degrees. That seems to be the best temperatures uh, for flower initiation. If they're cooler than that and especially um, you know if that photo period is right almost where it needs to be, it can actually trick the plant into initiating earlier. We're going to spend a lot of time talking about warmer temperatures and the impact that uh, warm temperatures can have on flower initiation, especially in late September in a lot of areas of the country. It's not uncommon to see some really warm days um, as well as some warm nights. Uh, and that's really what we'll be talking about is those warm nights and the impact that they have on initiation. 
warm nights or a higher ADT may actually delay, uh, delay initiation. So, you know, if your nights are fairly cool but you're still getting some excessive days, uh, excessive temperatures during the day, that uh, average daily temperature can have an impact on initiation. Heat delay is cultivar sensitive. Uh, we've done quite a bit of work with the University of Kentucky and the University of Florida doing some heat delay studies and uh, I'll show some pictures later that really uh, drive that message home that the varieties respond while most of them delay if the temperatures are excessive the amount of delay that you get is different with each variety. So heat delay, uh, really what we know the most about heat delay is that it, uh, night temperatures need to consistently be above 72 degrees Fahrenheit uh, in order to delay flowering. The, the amount of delay is cultivar specific and the amount of delay also appears to be more severe with the warmer temperatures. So that's something that we're st uh, you know, still need to do some research on to, you know, to know for sure the impact of different temperatures has on the amount of delay that you see. But, you know, we do know at this point that excessive delay is seen with excessive temperatures versus mild delay, uh, you know, with temps that are a little bit too warm. Some other factors that might play a role, um, and again, this is where uh, we need to do some more research, would be light levels at the time and then also photo period. When temperatures are excessive, you can actually get blind shoots, and this is where uh, the plants just uh, didn't initiate at all, but they also stopped vegetative growth uh, there just because it was excessive. The picture that I'm showing here on the screen uh, was taken at the 2008 University of Florida National Poinsettia Trials, and it's some images that they had up showing some results from their heat delay work that they did where the average daily temperature was 82 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, in the picture on the left-hand side, you can see prestige red and then prestige early and prestige red uh, to the far right. And, you know, we have many growers that have been very successful for a number of years with prestige red and don't see heat delay, or with freedom red, excuse me, and don't see heat delay. Uh, however, you know, you, we, do, we do know that heat delay is a common issue on prestige early and prestige red, and this was just some of the initial heat delay work that was done. Uh, when I go through the next slides, I'm going to show the University of Kentucky where temperatures were excessively warm and you actually saw some delay there even on freedom. So in 2009, um, Rebecca uh, Schnelli was the director of a heat trial at the University of Kentucky where they had two different temperature regimes that they ran uh, on the plants. The first was a 70 degree ADT uh, which was achieved with 75 degree days and 65 nights, which is pretty common uh, for, you know, that the second and third week in September. And then they also had some heat, uh, heated greenhouses where uh, they had an 85 degree ADT, which is 89 uh, degree days and 81 degree nights, which is very, very warm. Even in Florida, um, you know, in September, night temperatures are hopefully lower than 81 degrees. They had the plants on two different schedules to reflect whether they were early initiators or late initiators. So like Advent, Autumn, uh, the early prestiges, those were all planted and pinched about two weeks earlier than the other varieties. And then the heat treatment started um, in one case on September 2nd and went through October 16th and then um, on September 8th through October 23rd to kind of cover that wide range of when flower initiation might have occurred. So the series of pictures that I'm showing are just an example of the actual delay that we saw on some varieties that we typically don't at those excessive temperatures. But this is Autumn Red, which is another variety that southern growers have been very successful with uh, without any delay. But you can see that here at those really warm temperatures, there was an obvious delay. Um, this data was taken of about December 1st. Uh, you can see here this is Freedom Red as well, quite a bit of delay on the Freedom as well. And, you know, the plants that were grown at the regular ADT um, are probably even past their prime because they've been in the greenhouse and, and matured for a couple weeks where the plants that were delayed still have quite a bit to go. Um, you can see the, also the repercussions of those excessive temperatures. The plants that, um, you know, were grown at the warm temperatures are obviously a lot larger, a lot more stretched, um, probably some excessive leaf size. And so in addition to the repercussions of um, delaying initiation, you can also have an impact on vegetative growth. This is Prestige Early. Uh, you can see there's some obvious delay there, and then the same thing that we see on Prestige. So 
you know, I mentioned that we were going to talk about all the different factors that can have an impact on flower initiation. And now that we've talked about temperatures, we'll talk about growth regulator use. And uh, growth regulator use can have a significant impact on um, what your plants do in terms of when they'll initiate and then also development after initiation. Plants are more responsive to growth regulator uh, applications while they're initiating. So uh, what a, you know, a typical rate that might seem normal in late August, July and late August is probably going to be more than what's needed around the time of initiation because the plants are more responsive. There are certain chemicals that should just not be used um, close to flower initiation at all. Uh, the first one is B9, which is probably the most commonly used, and uh, we typically recommend that B9 not be used after September 5th through the 10th, and we say September 5th for those early initiators uh, like Prestige Early or Freedom or Advent, and actually it's probably a good idea to stay away from B9 in the month of September at all if you can help it. This is also going to be dependent on your geographic location. Uh, your northern growers are always going to naturally initiate a couple of days earlier than your southern growers and don't always have the light levels and the natural temperatures to support um, you know, what's needed to help that plant grow out of the B9 application. And so southern growers can always push the, you know, push the envelope a little bit more and apply it later than northern growers. But a good rule of thumb is just to stay away from it in the month of September altogether. Florel is also one that should not be applied after September 10th. Uh, it will delay flowering, and uh, it can either inhibit flowering or delay flowering. And there's kind of two different things that can happen here. One is that uh, you know flower initiation can be inhibited completely, or they'll still go through the initiation process, but because of that growth regulator application, it's delaying the process. And that's where you start to see the reduction in bract size, et cetera. Most growers are probably not going to be using Florel in the month of September unless, you know, we're talking about your pinched 4-inch or something and you're doing the sandwich technique. So, you know, when you schedule that pinch on the 4-inch, just be mindful that Florel probably shouldn't be used that late. Fascination is another one that, um, quite honestly, we don't know that much about what happens when fascination is applied around flower initiation. Uh, we have a number of growers now that are using fascination to get uh, more growth or to overcome a growth regulator application. Uh, we've also got growers that are applying fascination to get uh, some stem elongation so that they can do a mechanical pinch. Um, again, you're probably not going to be pinching in um, September unless it's 4-inch, but just be mindful of the fact that we, we aren't real sure uh, what fascination has, uh, what effect it has on flower initiation and the flower development process. Um, you know, there's some recent uh, initial studies from some recent work that was done at the University of Florida suggest that fascination has a significant impact on saithia retention. Now, we don't know if that's when it's applied at finish or if it's applied at flower initiation. So there's some more work to be done, um, but I guess you know, the take-home message there would be provide all the cultural, um, provide the right culture for the plants, do everything you can uh, culturally right so that if you can avoid it, you don't have to use a chemical like fascination. So other PGRs applied after flower initiation can have an impact then on the rate of development um, where they're going to delay development and reduce bract size. And this just reinforces the importance that it, you know, you know when the plants initiate because you know, you can't just go in and make a bonsai, even the micro drenches around, at or around the time when you think flower initiation is occurring because you don't know where it's at in that process. And depending on where it's at in that process could have an impact on, you know, bract reduction and timing. So especially with all your Paclobutrazole products like bonsai, piccolo, um, you know, any of those products, you really want to watch your timing, uh, your rates and dates on those before you make the application. Other chemicals to be mindful of would be a rest, sumagic, and top floor. Plant stress is not uh, something that we often see have an impact on initiation because it needs to really be extreme plant stress. You, you would have a pretty serious disease um, instance like pythium root rotting or phytophthora or something like that before it's actually going to have an impact on timing. Um, we also have seen an impact on timing when nutritional issues are present, but that's got to be some pretty serious issues, you know, where the pH is extremely high or extremely low. And then phytotoxicities from chemicals can also have an impact on initiation. So, you know, keeping those plants healthy is another insurance policy for making sure that they initiate on time. So, you know, we talked about the impact of warm temperatures and cold temperatures and the timing on flower and that you re really want to keep those temperatures um, as low as we can, you know, or within that optimal range so that they initiate. 
after flower initiation, though, when the plants are actually developing, warmer temperatures actually speed the rate of development. So temperatures are the driving force in flower development after initiation. Um, so as the ADT goes up, flower development speeds up. But faster isn't always better. Um, you know, so that's, again, where we would talk about the Bract meter and you know, using your temperatures to really program the crops, crops so that you get the best quality uh, with really warm forcing temperatures. If you find yourself behind and then you have to speed uh, warm your temperatures up, you're going to get floppy bracts that are faded uh, with those warmer temperatures. Things that would delay development after initiation uh, would include that initiation was delayed, you know, if the lights got left on, um, something like that, and then, or maybe possibly a late growth regulator application, you applied B B9 too late and it delayed initiation. Uh, light pollution is going to delay development. Uh, as Roger talked about, sometimes the plants will actually initiate and the signals aren't clear, so it takes the process longer and it's not good initiation, um, but that the plants actually continue to develop, it's just delayed. Plant stress, as I mentioned, severe plant stress, and then low temperatures are also going to have an impact on delayed flower development. So here's that bractometer that hopefully everybody's seen and hopefully you've used it in your greenhouse um, in your own situations. Uh, so what if initiation's off? You know, what if the lights got left on for an extra week and we didn't realize it? Um, what if the black cloth, you know, what if black cloth didn't get pulled? Uh, this does give you the tool to change the rate of flower development based on temperatures. Um, you know, so if you don't have an Eki bractometer, be sure to let me know and I can get you one. You can also find it online at Eki.com, but it really is a great tool to help you program the rate of flower development development. And then, you know, just a little uh, tip here, if initiation is unclear and it was off and you're not sure what's happened, be really mindful of your late growth regulator applications. Uh, try to use your negative diff at a, if at all possible and cultural techniques to reduce the growth regulate or to, to reduce the growth rate rate rather than use growth regulator applications uh, if you can at all help it or keep those rates low because if initiation was delayed, you know, everything's just going to be pushed back farther. All right, any comments, Roger, while I'm looking through questions? Yeah, you know, just one in a very practical sense. I know many of you still hang some poinsettias up in the air, uh, either in baskets or maybe you're hanging your three plants uh, or, or even twos, uh, maybe even some sixes. But uh, it's warm up there. And if you think about it, you really don't want to be hanging those if your heat's running too early, uh, you could get some heat delay in that process. So again, take a look at your initiation date and realize that you probably shouldn't hang within two weeks of that initiation just to let the signal be clear. Then put the plants up in the air and you don't run the risk at that point of it being just too high up where the heat goes up in the upper part of the greenhouse uh, where you could get heat delay, uh, which could be just because hot air rises or it could be because you've got heat tubes or heaters that are actually blowing air almost directly on the plants up at that level. Okay, we've got some good questions that have come in. A couple questions about Cycocell and Cycocell, uh, is it safe during the month of September and around flower initiation? And uh, yes, Cycocell is probably your best choice during the month of September. Um, and for your southern growers, typically the rule for Cycocell is that can, it can be used until approximately up to October 15th. Um, it's going to stay in the plant longer if temperatures are cool and light levels are poor. So if we end up with a you know fall with real crummy weather that's cool and cold, Cyclocell is going to sit in the plant a lot longer. If you've got really bright sunny days, warm days, good airflow, all the things that promote vegetative growth, it's probably still safe to go ahead and apply Cyclocell. But yes, you can do Cyclocell all the way through the month of September and even into October um, with you know some really good effects. And about a thousand parts per million is an appropriate rate. You can go anywhere from 750 all the way to 1500. Typically at 1500, uh, you will see some marginal yellowing from the cycle cell, but that is a safe rate. Uh, let's see here. Okay, so this person is saying, just to clarify, you are not recommending uh, micro uh, paclobutrazole drenches around initiation, and is it safer to wait seven to 10 days after initiation? You know, there are some growers that do the pa uh, the microbutrazol or the paclobutrazol micro drenches on a variety like snow cap or visions of grandeur, uh, for example, all the way through. And they may, may even start in late August, um, you know, early September, just because the vigor of that plant warrants, you know, a heavy growth regulator application. We don't 
uh, we don't know for sure, you know, what the impact that that will have on flower initiation. We know that it still takes place because there's growers that do it. It just might have an impact on timing and possibly bract expansion. So if experience has taught you that your plants finish, you know, within a reasonable amount of time and when you need them to, and you've used those micro drenches, then, you know, go ahead and keep doing it. But just really be mindful of the variety as well because, you know, the response is going to be different on each variety. Let's see. That's a good that's a good question. And certainly as you go deep into the south, the tolerances to these growth regulators is much greater than it is when you're up north of the Carolinas, for mm -hmm. example. So this next question is about average daily temperature and um this particular grower says an example would be, you know, what if your day temps are 85 degrees and your night temps are all the way down to 56 to 58 degrees, and so, you know, you're achieving an average daily temperature that's still in the range. What impact does that have on initiation? And, um, you know, I, it would have an impact on growth as well because of that large uh, positive diff. Roger, do you have any comments there when you have such a widespread in temperatures? No, I, we believe most of the impact comes from those night temperatures, and uh, certainly if you're uh, if you're cool, that's okay. But 58 I, is is too cooler than I would want in September on my poinsettia crop. So, as Rebecca mentioned, up in the prairie, you know, you've got to think about maybe putting some heat on. Um, you know, we've talked about cold grow program in previous webinars, and we really recommend paying a lot of attention to good temperature management, uh, the best you can provide during that middle of September period. Uh, it's worth it to invest in the time and effort. Uh, if it, the nights are hot still uh, where you're located, vent, run some vents, get that heat out of there to the best that you can. And uh, if it's cold, you really just can't say that, well, I'm looking at my calendar and I won't start my boiler until the 5th of October. Eh, it's not a good way to grow some years. Uh, some years you can do it. Every year is different. Uh, the, the winter weather comes in early sometimes, and it's cold. And certainly the 48 degrees uh, in the prairie last night is just too cold for a poinsettia. We don't recommend because, again, you're just providing a blurred signal to the plant. So be careful and keep it as close as you can. If your days are 85, I still wouldn't want to go below 65 at night on those plants for uh, the initiation period. Okay, we've got one more question before we turn it back over to Roger, and uh, just a, a quick answer to this one because it's a good plug for a webinar that we'll be having in a few weeks about growth regulating, and this grower has a question about what's a micro drench, because I've mentioned that a couple times. Uh, micro drenches are like bonsai drenches at a really low rate, so like 0 .0, uh, 0 0.1 to 0 0.2 parts per million, and they're applied, um, you know, at a time early in flower development when Typically, in years past, we didn't recommend any growth regulating at all because of the impact that it had on bract expansion. But micro drenching is a new technique um, that's been successfully used for a couple years now, three or four years uh, with a lot of growers. And there's a lot of information on, on board, our Tech Help Bulletin Board, about micro drenches. And as well, uh, towards the end of September, we will be having a webinar about uh, all the growth regulating aspects of poinsettias. So, uh, with that, we'll go ahead and go back to Roger, who's going to talk with us about scheduling. Okay, scheduling based on the initiation. Varieties that initiate early should be planted and pinched early because of early initiation dates. And I mentioned earlier the difference between prestige early red and prestige red, that you need to plant earlier, pinch earlier, because the prestige early initiates earlier if you want to get the same height out of the plant that you do a prestige. It stands to reason that you just need that vegetative time from pinch to start of short days to provide enough time for good, good growth and uh, good height development, enough leaves under the bract. Pinching too close to initiation results in shorter vegetative growth phase and short plants. Maybe that's a good way to grow a four inch pot or a three inch pot, but if you're doing six inch, oftentimes you're better off even if you're a little late with your pinch, you're a little late in production uh, against the schedule you originally planned, maybe just light uh, for a period of time to give yourself that enough time uh, uh, between pinch and initiation to build a nice plant under the bract. Um, and I mentioned here Prestige Early initiates September 15th, Prestige Red uh, about 10 days later. So to compensate for that in your scheduling, we'd be glad to help you with that process if you find it a bit complicated. 
And we do have uh, templates available um, from technical services and online for uh, production scheduling. You want to, you know, choose the right size pot, know what your finished height is uh, up ahead uh, of production, and schedule everything to allow proper time to grow the plant uh, as you need to. Um, pick the right cultivars based on those ship dates and the type of color, of course, and, and form of plant that you want. We have, uh, you know, over 80 plants uh, available, different varieties, and there's plenty to choose from to uh, fit the slots that uh, you want to fill for your customers. Here's a scheduling worksheet indicating vegetative growth requirements. Uh, you want to have enough time the number of days uh, for vegetative growth between pinching and flower initiation, as I just mentioned, and there's some uh, based on different product forms, uh, whether you're in the north, central, or southern region, uh, to allow enough time for that occur. And certainly those in the south uh, probably initiate later anyway, but plants develop quickly because of the warmth and the high light. Uh, you growers that are up in the north, uh, you know your schedules pretty well probably from experience and uh, you know that you need to uh, give them time and uh, that time up front is critical because that's when the weather conditions are best. They only deteriorate later. It's hard to catch up with a poinsettia crop at the end of production. And a scheduling worksheet for vegetative growth adjustments, number of days uh, suggested between the pinch and flower initiation uh, based on growth habits, whether it's a short variety, a medium variety, or a tall variety. Now, a tall variety would be like snow cap, and a short variety uh, would be like max red. So, um, you know, we can help you select those products, the right varieties, and uh, help you schedule uh, those plants. But certainly that information is available in the catalog and online, and you can take a look and uh, schedule on the safe side, figuring worst weather, worst inputs, uh, and leave yourself a little bit of uh, buffer in the program. Don't try to force these plants too hard. It will reduce the quality. Establishing requirements, number of days required to establish the rooted cuttings into the container prior to pinch. And there we like to see you know, plenty of time to develop a good root system and uh, build the plant so that uh, you know, before pinch, you've got a good, strong, healthy plant. You don't want to pinch it and, and uh, right after you transplant it, the plant's still in shock. Uh, let it build a root system first, and you'll get a better breaking opportunity and, and build up of the plant. Some of you may see sometimes those lower shoots don't quite come out too good, or you don't get the shoot count develops the way you want. Uh, that's often because you haven't quite given them enough time uh, after propagation for the roots to establish in the pot before you pinch. So uh, take a look at that table and uh, factor that in properly. Now here, as promised, uh, is a chart, uh, first of two, indicating the initiation dates of some of the varieties uh, based on research work, as uh, Rebecca was talking about earlier. Advent Red's our earliest to flower. Uh, it's a September 10th initiation date and, and develops very quickly. Typically by the 1st of November, you've got good color uh, and shippable material in Advent Red, so it's very early. Uh, Dulce Rosa, uh, the, that nice hot pink is also an early one. Uh, freedom early, uh, and so on down the line. You can see there's a number of them for September 10th. Then there's a group of sort of intermediates uh, that come in around the 15th of September with initiation. And the next page, we see September 25th is the dates. And these are typically your later varieties, uh, Red Velveteen, Independence Red, Peter Stars, Snowcap, um, you know, tapestries in there. Uh, Max Red, Visions of Grandeur is a later variety. Uh, some of them develop quicker than others, but uh, generally their initiation dates do seem to correlate with their overall uh, flower timing as well. So um, you can take a look at that list and uh, apply that information there. You can see third from the bottom is Solstice Red, one of our new varieties. It's a great red, and uh, it flowers uh, on a nine-week program, so it comes in you know, substantially later than the others, and it's good for some of those late sales in early December. 
Any questions? Yeah, uh, the questions that we've had come in since those last two screens have gone up with the initiation dates is can they get a copy of the initiation dates? And um, as I mentioned before, this presentation will be on, online approximately 24 hours after we end the session for viewing. Another thing I could do is take everybody's email addresses that we have from when you registered and actually email you those spreadsheets because they are a useful tool uh, for you to have, you know, so that you know, when you set all the factors aside and what can have an impact on initiation, those are the dates that typically under normal circumstances all of our varieties are going to initiate. So um, I can definitely email those to everybody and have them for you to use uh, later. I'm going to scroll through questions here real quick and make sure that we didn't miss any um, as we well, finish just up. Tip, just a tip on uh, lighting again, going back to that a bit. For those of you uh, that do want to light a crop, make sure you check your lights at night and uh, make sure you're getting the effect that you want. Go in with a light meter and check your light levels. It's good to put the lights on during the day to check the light bulbs and make sure that none of them have burned out. And one of the things that uh, I've seen many growers do is hook a clock up to their lights so that if they're not sure the lights are running for four hours, the clock should have advanced during the course of the night by four hours or adjust it if you're using the 20 minute program every hour of light. But you should see that advance and of course if you come in the next day and the clock still reads the same it did uh, when you left work uh, the evening before, then your lights probably aren't working. You need to check the circuit. You'd be surprised how often that happens. Light checks should be occurring probably three times a week because like I said, you don't want to go two or three days with a, a, a bad signal. Uh, in there during that critical time. It's worth it to invest that time during initiation. Every year many growers run into trouble with initiating and not having their crop time and they're either calling us and saying I'm really green and it's December 1st, uh-oh, or maybe they're initiating a little bit too early uh, and uh, they didn't watch your temperatures and some of those other inputs uh, during September to make sure that the timings were, uh, were going to come in true to the schedule. Okay, uh, we have a question about the latitudes uh, where those natural initi or those initiation dates that we gave on the uh, spreadsheets are referencing. Um, and, you know, we did mention that, that flower initiation is going to vary by two, three, four, maybe even five days, depending on if you're in the north or uh, the extreme south. Uh, those uh, dates that we gave would probably be uh, dates that you could go by if you're in the north and the central and even um, you know the northern part of the south Florida Texas along the Gulf Coast your dates are naturally going to be a few days later just because of temperatures would you agree with that Roger mm -hmm. yeah. okay Good. Well, those are all that we've had come in for questions. Uh, just a reminder that if you have further questions, you can go to www.ecchi.com and go to production guidelines or crop information. That's where you're going to find detailed poinsettia information. We also have on board our technical help bulletin board. Uh, it's free, it's fast, and it's easy. You can get answers uh, always within a 24-hour period. And we also have our uh, free web-based height tracking program on target. Hopefully all of you are utilizing that program now and tracking the height of your poinsettias. Uh, just a reminder that this is uh, part of a six-part webinar series that we're having this summer um, and into the fall. Later this September, we're going to be doing poinsettia growth regulating and also a piece called Increase Profits with Ecchi Cold Grow. Uh, we're going to talk with you about all the advantages and the actual savings that you can uh, benefit from if you grow poinsettias cold using Ecchi Genetics. And then in October, we'll do poinsettia finishing and post-harvest handling, and we've got some great information to offer based on some post-harvest studies that were done at Kentucky and Florida again. Um, I'd like to thank today uh, Jim Barrett from the University of Florida for his heat delay work that we cited today and also Rebecca Schnelli at the University of Kentucky and the 2009 heat studies. Uh, that's it for today. On behalf of the entire staff at the Ecchi Ranch, I'd like you th to thank you for joining us uh, today and we hope that you have a great holiday weekend. Thanks everybody. Bye-bye.